Good morning, everybody. You ever hear a joke that you told, but somebody else told it, and you realize you probably ought not to have said that joke? That's my last name. Hi, my name's Don. Uh, it is a privilege to be here. It is an honor to be here. I got the great joy of spending yesterday uh, with Pastor Steve and the elders, and then we had a good lunch with the wives. We had a great time, fantastic time. Uh, and if you guys want to know what your pastor says about you behind closed doors, he loves you dearly. He is, he is so in love with you as a church. He speaks nothing but good things about every one of you. So I feel very blessed to be here. Um, we're going to be in John 21 uh, this morning. And if you are going to turn into your Bible, uh, I'll give you a little bit of time to do that. But I want us to just pray over this part of the section, this section of, of the service. And so, Father, we do thank you. We thank you, Father, that your spirit is always speaking and always moving. We don't serve a dead God that only exists in a book or in history, but we serve the true and living God. You are as alive today as you were 2,000 years ago at the cross or at creation. You are speaking. You are with us. And, Father, I am grateful for the ministry and legacy of this church. I'm honored to be in the presence of these saints. And, Father, my prayer is that you would speak through me, that it's not my opinion, it's not my voice, but your word speaks through your scriptures. And so we give this time to you, in Jesus' name, amen. John 21, starting in verse 1. After Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, which is another name for the Sea of Galilee, and he was revealed himself in this way, Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said, we're going to come. That's my paraphrase. They went out, got on the boat, and that night they caught nothing. Just as the day was breaking on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, have you caught any fish? They said, no. And he said to them, well, cast your net on the right side of the boat, for you the right side of the boat. And you will find some. So they cast it. Now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. The disciple whom Jesus loved, which is John, the author of this, therefore said to Peter, It is the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard it was the Lord, for the first time in history, he put his clothes on and then went to swim. I skipped over all that. When Simon Peter heard it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment and that was stripped for work. He threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came to the boat, dragged the net full of fish, for they were not far from land, but about a hundred yards off. And when they got out of the land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with the fish laid out on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of those fish you've just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard, hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus said to them, come, have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. And Jesus came, took the bread, gave it to them, and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus had revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. So this is John 21. This is a setup story for Jesus eventually having a conversation with Peter and restoring him back into ministry, but this is a great story in and of itself. And before we dive into it a little bit, I want to give you a little history and background of John 21. It's the final chapter of this gospel. And there were, for a while, there were critics that were trying to say that this was an additional chapter to the book, that it didn't actually belong to the original writings, and they would cite things like the language was a little bit different, or chapter 20 ended so well, there was no need for this other verse. But I just want to say, if you've heard this before, or if somebody ever says this to you, John 21 is supposed to be there. Every single early manuscript that we have of the book of John includes chapter 21. Now, there is something to be said about the language being a little bit different, but it's also a whole lot the same. So what most academics and scholars and the people that are really smart about this kind of stuff, the conclusion that they've come to is that John finished his gospel and then very quickly, like within a year or two, realized, I, I probably should have told this story about Jesus at the shore as well. 
And so I don't tell you that just to fill your mind with something because what that tells me is that something so significant happened that John thought, I need to go back and and add that in. And there's significance to what is going on in this story because it rounds out what happened with Jesus and the disciples and it rounds out what happened with Peter. So when we get into this, I want us to know that this is a particularly special chapter. There are some really great things going on. And so as we dive into it, I want us to now get into the mindset of where the disciples were. The disciples were not in a good place right now. They'd spent years following one man, Jesus Christ. Everywhere that he went, that's where they went. He was their master in a very real sense. They ate when he said to eat. They went where he told them to go. They did whatever he asked them to do. He was their leader. Now they did it in love and obedience and joy. I don't wanna paint a false picture there, but he was very much their leader. Everything that they knew about life following Jesus came from Jesus. And very shortly before this chapter, Jesus was crucified on the cross as a criminal. And now he had come back, he had seen them a few times, but he wasn't with the disciples every single day. And Jesus was arrested and crucified as a criminal. And so what the scriptures tell us is that the disciples thought they might be next. If Jesus was hunted down, if Jesus went through a kangaroo court, if Jesus had somebody lie about him to kill him, what's to keep the authorities from finding us as well? Peter in particular knew that he had abandoned Jesus in his time of need. Peter in particular knew that he had refused to acknowledge his relationship with Jesus three times. And so I don't think it is any coincidence that it was Peter sitting around. Are you the type of person that you just can't sit still for five minutes? You, there's some, you gotta do something, right? You got a list going. There's always something that you can do. I think this might've been Peter because he lost Jesus. Jesus wasn't telling him what to do anymore. His only instructions are to wait. All right, is everybody in the room good at waiting? Because I can go and ask your spouse how your first two weeks of quarantine were if, if we need to start telling stories on people. And so Jesus, or so, so Peter didn't have his leader anymore and he was all torn up inside about denying Christ. And so I'm not surprised that as he was just sitting there with the guys, he said, I can't sit here any longer. I'm going fishing. And they thought, man, that's a good idea. We're gonna go fishing too. So the context of what brought the disciples into this place is they were scared for their lives in some degree. They were confused. They didn't know how to move forward. They weren't sure what the next day was going to bring. They knew Jesus was alive and active, but again, they didn't see him every day. They weren't sure when the next time they were going to see him was. Peter felt bad about things that he'd done. And so when we get into this story, I want us to understand that this is where the disciples were. And so this is how we can approach this scripture if we're ever in this place. Have you ever been in a time of your life where you felt confused about what was going on? Have you ever been in a time in your life when you weren't sure what the end of the day was going to look like, let let alone tomorrow? Have you ever in your life, once at least, regretted something that you did or didn't do? Have you ever in your life, if you're honest, wondered if God was really hearing your prayers? When was he going to respond? When was I going to get the sign? When was the flashing billboard going to come and descend from heaven and tell me exactly what God wanted? I know we're just getting to know each other, so I won't probe you too hard to make you raise your hand, but I'll confess I've been there before. I've been confused before. I've wondered what was going on before. And so whenever we find ourselves in these situations, I want us to know we can come back to this verse and find some cool answers. Maybe you are here this morning. I want you to know something about the Holy Spirit. If you don't know this about the Holy Spirit, he's really good about putting puzzle pieces together there's a very good possibility that you are here this morning to hear this message. So if this is you, I hope that this helps. I hope God is helping you. So what can we pull away from this story? The first lesson that we can learn in all of this is that Jesus is consistent. Malachi says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. But we see this in verse seven. 
The disciple whom Jesus loved, that's John, therefore said to Peter, it's the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment that it was stripped for work and he threw himself into the sea and he swam over there. Well, what in the world happened that was so definitive for John to say while he was still on the boat, he didn't see Jesus from the shore. His eyesight couldn't identify the shape of Jesus. What in the world happened that John was able to scream out, that's Jesus. And he specifically said it to Peter, Peter, that's Jesus. I know that that's Jesus. Was it just that it was a miracle or was it something else? I would submit to you that it's because of how Jesus actually met John and Peter in the very first time. Luke 5 actually tells us this great story. When Jesus had finished speaking, says verse 4, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets to catch. And Simon, who is Peter, answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. Does this sound familiar? But at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish. Does this sound familiar? The nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boats to come and help them. And they came and filled the boat so that they began to sink. And when you look at the full context of that story, John was there. Peter was there, and that's just a few verses before Jesus says, now I'm going to make you fishers of men. Luke 5, I encourage you to go look at that. So the very first time that John and Peter ever met Jesus was by him telling them where to cast their nets and catching so many fish that they couldn't haul it in. This is the reference that John would always have of Jesus. Even your best friend, even your spouse, somebody that you've known for a long time, can you think of the first memory that you have with them. The first moment where you met, where you always would have that as a reference for your relationship. Joke they told somewhere that you met. This is kind of how John was. He saw Jesus perform thousands of miracles, preach thousands of messages, but he would always have in the back of his mind, the day I met Jesus, the day I met my best friend, the day I met my savior was the day I was fishing and frustrated, couldn't catch anything, that guy tells me to try one more time and I catch so many fish that the nets start to break. So I imagine as John and Peter were looking for Jesus again, even subconsciously, when somebody yells from the shore, hey, try the other side of the boat. I'm hoping that something in their mind starts going, oh, I've heard this before. And then they do, and they pull up so many fish that they can't even haul it in. And that's when John knew, that's Jesus. That's exactly how I met him. That's exactly what he did before. He's done it again. I know that that's Jesus. Peter, you were there the first day. Isn't that Jesus? And Peter said, you better believe that is our Savior. That's Jesus. And so he put his clothes on and went swimming to go find him. And what we get from this is that Jesus is consistent. And the way that Jesus met them the first time is how he met them the second time. If you are in a place in your life today where you are feeling confused or broken or hurt or you need God to show up, I want to ask you this question. Has he ever answered a prayer for you in the past? Has he ever shown up in your life before? Because if God has answered a prayer for you once, I assure you in his consistency, he is willing to do it again. And so this is one of those memories. This is one of those thoughts we can take into these times of saying, the world is in a crazy place right now. But praise God, he's seen the world in a crazy place before. He answered the prayers of the saints before and he can answer the prayers of the saints again. Personally, in my own life, God, I am so confused, but you've brought me out of confusion before. I am broken, but you've brought me into healing before. I am so broken by my sin, but you've forgiven me for it. And we can have a remembrance that if Jesus has done something before, he can do it again. And then there's some great things about this idea that I wish I had a little bit more time to really jump into. First and foremost is that you know you can borrow faith from someone else. Ah, oh, you didn't know that, good. See, if I am in a situation in my life and I just can't think of a time where God has answered my prayer, 
Or if we're gonna be honest with each other, can we be honest in church? I refuse to allow God to remind me of a time he's been faithful because I wanna throw a temper tantrum. I'm just talking to me. And I go to my brother Steve and I say, Pastor Steve, I, I don't know what's going on. You know what Pastor Steve can do? He can say, well, let me tell you about a time where God showed up in my life. Let me tell you about a time where God answered a prayer in my life, where God was provisional in my life. And then he can comfort me and say, brother, if God did it for me, I know he can do it for you. So I would encourage you, find people of faith to surround yourself with. Find people of faith to speak into your life. Find people that believe the scriptures, believe that God is living, believe that God is still moving in the lives of his saints. Surround yourself with those voices, and when you're feeling low, you can borrow their faith. But if you say, I don't know any Christians, I don't know any people of faith, I can't think of a time when Jesus has ever done anything for me. Well, I've got good news for you. 2,000 years ago on a cross, and the greatest statement of love that has ever existed for humanity to witness, Jesus loving the entire world, including yourself, knowing that you were lost in sin, what the scriptures say, an enemy to God, whenever you did not deserve it, when I did not deserve it, Jesus died on the cross so that we wouldn't have to, came back to life three days later so that we could walk in new life Jesus has done something for you. He died on a cross for you. He's offering new life for you. And if there is one thing that I would encourage you to always be able to go back to is that if Jesus went through the trouble of dying for me, he's not going to abandon me today. So what's the second thing we can learn? That Jesus wants us. Not needs, wants. Did you know that Jesus wants you? I've got a daughter. She's five years old. She's awesome. I love her. She is a daddy's girl, and I am a girl's daddy. <laughs> but, you know, I've, we've gotten to the point now where as daddy says, hey, honey, I love your dress. You look really good today. She kind of dismisses that and goes, well, you're my dad. You're, you have to say that. And I wonder how many of us have gotten to a place with God whenever we hear something in Scripture, maybe a promise, maybe a good blessing, somebody speaks something to us about the goodness of God. I wonder how many of us have gotten it into our mind to say, well, God has to say that. He has to. He's supposed to say that. Well, I want to say this to you. No, he wants to say that because he wants you. He cares about you. He wants you. And we see Jesus doing this exact thing. Oh, I didn't put my scripture verse there. We'll figure it out. Verse 9. When the disciples got out into the land, they saw a charcoal fire in place. They didn't build that fire. Jesus did. With fish laid on it. This is not the fish that the disciples just caught. Jesus had his own fish. Now, I got to walk you through a thought here and make sure that I'm, I'm not misspeaking. Jesus had his own fish. But when we keep going, Jesus said to them, bring some of those fish that you just caught. So Jesus had his own fish already on the fire, but then he asked the disciples to bring their fish to the fire. If there are two ways where we can get our relationship with God a little off kilter, a little twisted, one is the ditch or the, one is the way of thinking to say, God has to do everything and I'm just gonna sit back and wait for it to happen. I don't have to engage, I don't have to think, I don't have to pray, I don't have to go. If God wants it done, he'll do it himself and I've got a front row seat. The other way that we can sometimes get a little wrong is I've got to do everything before I'm going to think about going to God. I've got to get my life right. I've got to get my problems right. I've got to get my mind right. I've got to get my faith right. I've got to get everything perfect, and then maybe God will let me around 
And what Jesus showed us right here is that the truth, like sometimes it does, lies somewhere in the middle. Jesus didn't need the disciples' fish to eat breakfast. And this is the part that I want to walk us through. God doesn't need anything. He is perfectly self-sufficient. He is able to exist in his own way. The God of the cosmos, the source of all things, doesn't need anything. Jesus didn't need the fish. He wanted the disciples to bring their fish. God doesn't need me to do anything. He wants me to join him in relationship. He wants me to bring my gifts and talents into what he's already doing. He wants me to join him, as the old hymn would say, as a co-heir or a co-laborer in Christ. He's inviting me to participate, not out of duty or responsibility or the whole world's going to quit turning if I don't, but because he genuinely wants us around. He wants you to participate. He wants you to use your gifts. He wants you to speak out in his name. He wants you in communion with him. He wants to have breakfast with you. Breakfast is a special meal. This isn't in my notes. I've got time for it though. You'll have lunch with a business associate. You'll have dinner with friends, but breakfast is for family. Jesus wanted to have breakfast with the disciples. Guys, I missed you. Guys, I know I've got to take care of a lot of things, but I'm about to head out. You're not going to see me until you get up to heaven. Guys, let's just have breakfast. God wants to commune with you, be in a relationship with you, get to know you, care about who you are as a person. He doesn't need us. And I think this is better. What he wants is us. Our work with God is a co-labor. We're both working. Jesus gave Peter the fish and invited, oh yeah. And I'll add it this way too. So Jesus was on the shore with the fire eating fish or, or cooking fish that he brought he invited the disciples to bring their fish, but where did those disciples get that fish? Jesus. God will provide with for you the gifts that you need, the opportunity that you need, the blessing that you need, the calling that you need, the forgiveness that you need. God will give that to you out of his love for you, and then he's gonna invite you to use it. Amen. And our third point, the third thing that we get from this lesson, Jesus wants us. Jesus is consistent, but Jesus was on the shore. Verse 2, I want to tell you one of those times that I read the Bible and laughed. Verse 2 of chapter 21, Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel of, Can of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other guys. These weren't strangers. They were two of the 12. We've got the list. We know who they were. And I just, the first time that I read this, I just had a giggle to myself because I was like, man, can you imagine being one of the other two guys? I mean, like, you're going to put Thomas and Nathaniel in there and not me? <laughs> but then as I was having my giggle, God just kind of spoke to me in that. And he says, you want to know why? I said, why, God? says, because it doesn't matter as much who's in the boat as it does who's on the shore. Amen. Let it go. Let it rip, tater chip. If Jesus touches, you clap. It doesn't matter as much who's in the boat as it does is who is on the shore. Jesus was on the shore. Jesus spoke where the net ought to go. Jesus spoke the fish into the net, and the disciples were faithful in pulling it up. So my question for you this morning, church, is who or what is on your shore? 
When you are confused, lost, tired from fishing all night, and look, this is not the Zebco 33 where you get to just chill there. They had a net. They were hucking that sucker for eight hours. They were worn out. When you are lost and confused and broken by your sin and you are just feeling everything bad all at once, who or what do you hope is on your shore speaking to you? Who are you wanting to answer those prayers for you? And I'll say it this way, who do you think is going to fix your problems? Who do you bring those issues to? Who or what do you think, if you'll just give it to them or that, then everything's gonna be fine. See, the disciples knew if Jesus would just show up, be fine. Jesus needed to be on their shore. And when Jesus was on the shore, he spoke it all into goodness. Who's on your shore? My prayer right now is that the Spirit of God would start to show you who it is is on your shore. If it's Jesus, praise God. But if it's not, I want us to have an opportunity to work through that this morning. A guy named Dr. Daniel Pisani, Pisani, sorry, has identified that in the American culture, there are eight idols fighting for our attention. Eight possibilities of something or someone that is on our shore other than Christ. The first, frankly, is just a false deity. There's new culture of all religions are the same. Just don't hurt anyone. That's the American culture right now. Or that's the culture that's trying to fight against the Christian culture. All religions are the same. All thought processes are the same. All opinions are of equal value. All you got to do is just live your life where you don't hurt anybody. And then you're fine. And this is the rhetoric that the culture is starting to pick up. This is why people are leaving church or embracing another way of doing things. Because they have been given the trap that everything's the same. I just won't hurt anybody. And then it's fine. you fallen for a false doctrine? Have you fallen for a false religion? Have you fallen for a culture that cares more about something else other than the Word of God? And if everybody would just do this thing, then the problems would go away. Man, I wasn't going to say this, and I just felt the prompting to say this. God ever asked you to do something you didn't want to do, but you did it anyway? I'm going to help somebody today. They're online, though. Problems were not invented in 2016, nor were problems invented in 2008. We've had problems on the earth since Cain and Abel. We can't, see, I'm, I love you guys. <laughs> we're just getting introduced. Don't overshare on the first hangout. <laughs> Jesus in Jesus alone is going to get us where we need to go. Number two second idol is the idol of self we're just good enough on our own terms we can handle any problem that arises I'm smart enough I'm quick enough I can work hard enough I've got it within me I'm gonna pull my bootstraps out bootstraps up even harder and I'll get this figured out God don't worry about intervening not that big a deal number three technology now I want to clarify this technology is kind of like fire it's good in the right context, but it's bad in the wrong context. We have technology all over the place. There are people experiencing church right now because of technology. I somehow managed to get a Bible on this sucker. By the way, I've got five minutes, so I've got time for this. <laughs> so those of you who are just a little bit older than me, this might make sense. This is funny. This is a Zonko brand. Let's make a deal. Anybody? No, nope. okay, we'll move on. I hope you get to find out how bad a sense of humor I have. <laughs> Technology is good, it's helpful, it's a tool. It's not a Messiah. It's not going to fix every issue. If good people are using it as a tool for the Lord, it can do a lot of good. But it's not a God. Number four. Social media, specifically, how much can I fake who I am to impress strangers on the other end of the screen? 
I'm telling you, this is eating up our younger generation. Eating them up. You can't, saints, you can't make it through high school if you don't have a good social media presence. Can you imagine having to impress kids at your home? This is a... And you can't be real. If you give your opinion on something or if you express something that's imperfect, you don't put the highlight out there, you're going to get judged for it. And it's just to get people to like you that you're not even really sure if you want them to like you. Number five is status. Once I have these things or live in this house or do this certain thing, then I'll be a somebody and then I'll have made it. No more problems. Number six, materialism. Life's all about getting the stuff to make us happy and that and status can go really well together. Number seven is money. Money is like technology. It's not evil. It's how you use it. It's a tool. It's linked to materialism, but can also be linked to thinking that money will provide security. Greed into the point of suppressing other people. Thinking you have status and therefore should be treated better than others, the neglect of others, or just feeling as though you are worth somebody because you've got more money than somebody. James is really good about addressing that. And the last one, I know we're getting to the uncomfortable stuff. The last idol that Daniel Passini, Dr. Daniel Passini has identified is celebrities. There's a difference between a fan and a fanatic. It's more than possible to worship a celebrity, derive your identity from them, to spend more time trying to figure out who they're dating or what's going on in their life than what's going on in your own life with the Lord. So I'm not saying we can't have a fan, be a fan of people. I think we've all seen people take that way too far. See, people, we are designed to worship. But that worship goes to God. Not to a person, not to a thing, not to our own self. So I ask again, who's on your shore? What is on your shore? Is it something else here? Is it your job? Is it your time? Is it a person that you would be willing to forsake everything with God to give this person more of your attention? Who is on your shore? If you are a Christian, if you know Christ as your Savior, and the Holy Spirit is talking to you this morning about who is on your shore and it's not Jesus, I got good news for you. We can fix this real quick. The biblical word, the big word is repent. What does the word repent actually mean? It means to ask for forgiveness of what you have done and then get direction for what you should do. And so if I've been talking to you this whole time and you think, uh-oh, maybe something... Something else is my idol. Something else is deriving my attention. Something else is kind of where I'm putting my hopes and dreams and passions into. Something else is getting this mindset in me that if so-and-so would just do something, or if I could just get something, then the problems go away, and you know Christ, then let's get this fixed this morning. It's gonna be as simple as just saying, Father, I see that I've messed up. Please forgive me. The Lord says whoever asks for forgiveness will receive it. And then just say, now, how do I move forward, God? What do you want me to do to make Jesus the one speaking from my shore? If you're not a Christian, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, and you are here this morning, first let me say thank you for coming. It's not, it's not easy coming into a church for the first time or one of the first few times. It's not easy. But I believe you're here for a reason. I believe you're here for a purpose. And I believe this might be that purpose. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, and the whole time I'm speaking, you're thinking, I'd like to have Jesus on my shore. I don't know how to get him there. I would like to be able to call on Jesus. I don't know how. What do I do? How do I replace these other things? How do I live for Jesus? I want to show you some things. Some scriptures, all from the book of Romans. The first thing to know is this. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Another way of saying that is everybody is imperfect in God's eyes, myself included. 
If you have sinned, Romans 6 says, the cost of that sin is death. We all deserve to die. But the gift of God, which is what Christ did on the cross, is eternal life, living forever with God. I want you to know this, that God loves us, loved you, loved me while we were still lost in our sins. And Christ died for us. And if today you will confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Saved from your sin, saved from the death of that sin, and saved into a life with God on earth and an eternal life in the Spirit with God. In Romans 10, 13, if you're thinking, God doesn't know what I've done, preacher, you don't know what I've done. You don't know how bad I've messed up. You don't know all the things that I've done, all the sins that I've committed. I'm surprised that the chairs didn't catch on fire just whenever I walked in the building. You don't know anything about me. I want to give you Romans 10, 13, and I hope it is engraved in your heart. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord, will be saved. Whoever. You can't out God's grace and love for you. And so I want to lead all of us in a very short, quick prayer that if that's you this morning, online, if that's you, and you are ready to receive this gift of Jesus, this forgiveness of sins and walking in new life, this prayer will help you verbalize what's going on in your heart. These aren't magic words. We're not saying in the incantation. God's doing something in your heart. Sometimes we just need help with the words to make sense. And so what I'm going to ask is that everybody would bow your heads with me, everybody would close your eyes with me, and everybody would repeat these words after me. I really need your 